Welcome to the Right Time Podcast. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, we have officially reached the point in the sports calendar where we are leading off this show by talking about something that came on TV last night. Now, something that came on TV on this network, so they appreciate it when I do that sort of thing. Company man. But something that came on TV nonetheless, which is the 30 for 30 last night on the Celtics and the Lakers. I was watching it on the Twitter. You guys seem to really, really, really be enjoying it. And I guess it's wild because, like, I'm 36 years old. I'll be 37 in a couple of months. So for me, the first NBA final series that I remember happening, right, that I could be like, okay, I remember that, Celtics-Rockets, 1986. Like, I remember when Celtics-Lakers came around in 87, and it was such a big thing, and we had a basement at the house. we go down in the basement and turn it on. Like, people I hadn't seen in forever were down there. And uh, this is going to shock you guys, but everybody at the Jones house is rooting for the Lakers. I wonder what that's all about, right? Anyway, like, that is the one. And I had no context or understanding at the time of, like, historically what the rivalry was, which is not to say that I didn't understand that the rivalry had history. I just didn't understand that the rivalry had been so lopsided for so long, right? Like, I had no idea that the 1960s were basically, hey, Jerry West, how'd you like to get your head bashed in year after year after year by the same dudes? The dude that hates losing more than anybody on planet Earth, Michael Jordan included, just kept catching L after L after L at the hands of the Celtics, right? Like, it's, it was like at that point in my life, there was no way for me to conceive of this idea that somehow the Lakers were continuous also-rans. Like, what? You talking about that? The Lakers, man, they got Magic Johnson. Of course, at that time, too, you could have told me Magic Johnson had played for 30 years, and I would have believed it also. But it's fun for me watching these things as they happen because, one— I'd love to play the old man thing and be like, yeah, you young boys, get a chance to go back and watch basketball was what it was like back in the day. But then the other level is I get into something like that and I realize, wait a minute, I didn't like actually know these things either, right? Like I didn't have any real appreciation for the time and place on any of those things with the Lakers and Celtics. So I like that. This is the the thing with the 30 for 30s, especially from the beginning and coming into now. Like these are bigger names, like more marquee value on this. But I love when we're able to do these and get to, like, to subtle elements of stories that people forget. Like I worked as an executive producer on the 30 for 30 called Rand University. That was about Randy Moss. And what made that cool to something to do was that we were not doing just Randy Moss NFL highlights. You wind up getting to a level of the Randy Moss story that had kind of been forgotten in time. Like what it was for it to be Randy Moss in high school, the college Randy Moss stuff and everything else. Right. Like, you know, you got to get be- I want to say beneath the surface necessarily. But there are things that happen with stories now we get to that second level and you remember it but when we tell the story down the line it's not necessarily going to come up like this is your chance to revisit those sorts of things and even with something like Celtics and Lakers as big as that was there's still those levels underneath that you get to talk about and that you get to discuss and so they do five hours on this and this is legit probably worth like seven hours like I don't know how much more time they could possibly get this like I mean this was that right so the first two episodes were on last night. They ended at the 1984 NBA Finals when Magic Johnson just came apart. What they call it, Shannon? Tragic Johnson. Tragic Johnson. Ma- Keep in mind, by the way, Magic already had two rings. Two rings and two Finals MVPs, right? And we still threw them out. And that's Magic, who people like. I was trying to imagine, think about if you would have had that situation with Magic. Two MVPs, two final MVPs, but choked in that situation. Imagine if that was today and the amount of ridicule. The only comparison I have is really LeBron. Well, I think that's the parallel, right? It would be like LeBron 2011, except LeBron didn't have the stripes yet. Like, it was a matter of, are you going to be able to do it? What's wild about that thing with Magic is people just went retroactive. And, like, wiped everything off that Magic had done previously. We'd seen Magic win in college. You'd seen Magic win in the pros. you seen Magic win at 20 years old. Magic had one bad series. And they're like, you know what? Maybe this guy isn't anything. Of course, uh, Shannon, for Magic, it was the worst timing as the guy on the other side of that was, you know, Larry Bird. There's that. There's that in every dynamic associated with Bird Magic, right? Like, you know, think about it now. Because Magic old, right? A, Magic's old, and B, can I be honest? Can we be real about this? We also glad we got Magic, right? 
that we do. Like, he is a universally beloved figure. Like, that's the way that you think about Magic. At that time, Magic was the counterpoint to Bird. Bird was the counterpoint to Magic. Like, there are so many people who had one guy on either side of that rivalry who took literally decades before they could go back and realize how good the other dude was. Like, it's wild when I go talk to my father about Larry Bird. Like, I remember the way he talked about Larry Bird when Larry Bird was playing. Wasn't here for it at all. Never mind the numbers and everything else. Wasn't here for it with Larry Bird. Yet about 15 years later, suddenly he could go back and appreciate how good Larry Bird was. I think a lot of that was the same for people with Magic Johnson. Like this rivalry, this I feel like Celtics-Lakers was less about which team you liked and probably spoke a lot more to what your lifestyle was, like what your social interaction was. It got to spoke to what you thought basketball was, what you thought basketball should be, what you thought made somebody a better basketball player. Like, all those things were thrown in there together, and you had them as big markets. Because you could talk about, like, you know, and and that's the 80s part. Because you could talk about the 60s, the 70s, I mean, it wasn't really much of a discussion because it didn't seem like either of them were good at the same time. They didn't play in the finals at all in the 1970s, um, I don't believe. But in the 60s is one thing because the Celtics had all the players and, you know, there's no free agency, all that stuff, you run through it. In the 80s, I really do think it then became a matter of like, so what set you playing, fool? You definitely had to pick a side. Like, it couldn't be, oh, no, I like Magic and, and I like Larry. Oh, no, pick a side. Right, right. And don't be – here's the thing about it, though. You could be a white dude and root for the Lakers. It could be done, right? Like, you could be the white dude, you could be rooting for the Lakers, and people would be like, okay, cool, I can see it. But, man, if you was the black dude rooting for the Celtics back in those days – Shannon, all I got is Howard Bryan and Mike Hitman. That's it. That's all I got. Remembers a new addition. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. D- D- Lavelle, our man Lavelle, he even root for the Celtics because our cards were getting pulled on that one. That scene didn't do the right thing with the white dudes walking around with the Larry Bird jersey. It wasn't just a wardrobe choice, baby. That was a symbol. Like, that's what that spoke to. Walk up in the spot with a Larry Bird. You black walk up in the spot with a Larry Bird jersey. The needle come off that record so fast. So fast. It's another element of it because Larry Bird wanted no parts of that. Like, I'm just a basketball player. I didn't want to be the great, quote unquote, the great white hope. Mm -hmm. But so many people built him up to be that, and he was uncomfortable with that. Did they mention that in the 30 for 30? I didn't actually watch it. Yep. Oh, he did bring that up. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. In the term, in, in the term. Him being asked back then in an interview and using the term great white hope. Did I ever tell you, by the way, about the time we had Wes Welker on Dad's radio show? And I figured that he would not like, you know, Wes Welker, the white receiver, right? Every every receiver is Wes Welker. And so I asked him, I was like, yo, so how tired do you get of every white wide receiver being called the next Wes Welker? And I expect him to be like, yo, it's so frustrating. Incorrect, guys. Wes Welker was like, I love it. <laughs> That's dope. I'm that. Larry Bird, like, nah, nah, nah. But also keep it in mind, Larry Bird and his hostility toward white basketball players. Larry Bird believed it was an insult to have a white dude guarding him. And he said this in, like, the 21st century. Like, what he was saying back then, that's what he said with perspective and everything else. He's like, nah, 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 nah. You need to, hey, hey, could y'all please have uh, somebody else guard me, please? I'm about to light Tom Chambers up. Tom Chambers said hops. In case you ain't know. You're going to say something about Mark Jackson, aren't you? Yeah, I was going to reference it. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, look, man, Mark Jackson got to live with that. He caught that tiger knee to his chest, and Tom Chambers just kept going up. Like, I feel like Mark Jackson looked up and saw who was coming. I was like, oh, I'll be good. I'll just take a charge. Then it was like, oh, wait a minute. That's Tom Chambers. Rut row. The next thing you know, Tom Chambers was bouncing off him, going to the rim. Tom Chambers did not play for the Celtics, but I got cash money that says Red R back at one point made a call and was like, so what do you think? Uh, you think you got, you think we can get Tom Chambers? Like after Mikhail's foot went bad, you telling me Red Auerbach wasn't like, all right, let me get a list of guys that's out there. What about Tom Chambers? What about that? Because I'm glad they mentioned in the 30 for 30, like racist subtext, because it's kind of unavoidable in this. And the part that's wild about it, though, is it's not just that the Celtics tended to have more white dudes than most basketball teams had. It's that Red Auerbach apparently had a Google alert even in the 1970s for whoever the coldest white dude was on the planet at that time, he's going to wind up playing here. I don't know how he didn't get Rick Barry. Is that how much of a jerk Rick Barry was? That even Red Auerbach was like, nah, we don't even know why I do that bad. They had Kevin McHale, Larry Bird, and Danny Ainge on the team at the same time with Bill Walton off the bench. Now, we ain't talking about like Greg Kite and Jerry Sickting and all them other cats that were just there, you know, to, to fill it out. 
But no, the Celtics were like, it, it wasn't like they were just getting any white dude. They were getting the best white dudes on earth. And then they go play the Lakers, who had Kurt Rambis. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. So uh, we were just talking about the Lakers-Celtics uh, 30 for 30 last segment. Uh, what my man here, my bitches say, because I talked about how, look, maybe there was white folks rooting for the Lakers, but the black people rooting for the Celtics were few and far between. My man said it was so hard to cheer for the Celtics after the Sixers would lose in the 80s, but it was East versus West. I, your house is about East versus West, huh? <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that's that. I didn't know how many people were like really drawing the line there. Also, my man Scott said he loved that Ice T is narrating the thirty for thirty and close but no cigar. Close, close, almost. I can see how you can make that mistake. Almost. But uh, me and Shannon were talking about this before the show, and Shannon made a very good point about that documentary that I think it should help people with. Is everybody out here talking about how the NBA needs some parody? When have we had the parody? And what is the parody going to make better? Because was anything better than getting, I guess this is in episode three that you're going to get, but anything better than getting the Celtics and the Lakers for three out of four years in the NBA Finals? Is there anything better than that? You go back and look at the 1980s. Five teams in the whole league made the NBA Finals in the 1980s. Five teams. The Rockets, the Lakers, the Celtics, the Sixers, and the Pistons. That's it. That's all. That's those the only teams who wound up making it, right? And remember, the Celtics went four years in a row. The Lakers went eight times out of ten. Eight out of ten. Ain't nobody ever had no parity in the NBA. How many championships the Celtics went in the 1960s? You know when you had parity in the NBA? I tell you when you had parity in the NBA. You had parity in the NBA in the 1970s. Please let me know the last time you heard somebody reminiscing on the good old days of the 1970s. Because I got nothing on that, right? So let me think about the, the 70s. Well, we got the Bucks won one. Well, the Celtics won one. The Bucks won one. The, I mean, the Celtics won more than one. But the, the Bucks, the Celtics, the Lakers, the Bullets, the Sonics, the Blazers. Y'all don't long for that. Nobody's like, tell me tell me how much you remember about the the 78 or 79 Sonics, whichever one it was that won the championship. You don't know who's on that team. Now, granted, the NBA was barely on television at that time. But, man, it's all notion. Basketball is not a game where you intend to have parity. Like, the parity thing works in the NFL in large part because it's a single elimination, like, all the time, basically. Even the regular season feels like a single elimination tournament. So you can have that because there's always going to be that luck factor that's thrown in there by the fact that all it takes is you lose one game for you to get out of there. You can't have parity in the NBA, man, because the best basketball team is going to win. And somehow we act like the best team winning is bad. Like, that's a problem. We knew who was going to win it. Okay, so you don't want the best team to win. I don't really understand why you. Hmm. That's strange. I thought it made it better to have that one singular team that everyone's trying to achieve and try to beat rather than it being a different team year in and year out. You have that one singular team. What can, right now, the discussion right now, what can the Cavs do now in this offseason to beat right. the Warriors? Like, everything now is how do we beat the Warriors? And, the, by the way, the Warriors have run through the league for three years. And this year, go look at the Warriors' television ratings. The Warriors' television ratings are great. Like, for the NBA, I feel like a lot of what it is for people deciding what they're going to watch is just basically entertainment. Like, go look at the Thunder's ratings. People love watching Russell Westbrook, right? Like, it doesn't matter if they're, quote-unquote, competitive for a championship or not. They love to watch Russell Westbrook play basketball, and that's basically good enough. But, no, I don't think that you need parity at all to make the NBA entertaining. That's just not how this works. Basketball, really unlike these other sports, you watch it because you love it. Like, football is a social activity as much as anything else. It's not to say that people don't love football, but, like, you watch, you know, you watch the Super Bowl. Why? Because, I mean, it's what we do. We watch the Super Bowl. I'm not interested all the time in who's in the Super Bowl, but we watch the Super Bowl because it's just kind of a thing that you do. And the way that people get into football has a lot to do with social relationships, a lot to do with identity politics, all that stuff. Basketball. Basketball got a whole lot more to do with just, man, I really enjoy watching these guys play basketball. And if you get parity, you know what you're going to have? A bunch of teams that aren't worth watching. Because the only way that you got parity is if nobody is really good. And basketball is is very similar to another activity that people videotape very often. It's only worth watching when it's the best. 888-729-3776. Let's hit the phones and talk to Coach from Michigan. Coach, thanks for calling the right time. 
on, Bomani. How you doing, man? You the best, man. I mean, you know, I, I really, after listening to you when you first got going on, I really think that you keep everything real. I got a lot of respect for you. Thank you, man. You haven't had any bloopers. You ain't made no mistakes. <laughs> and, and, and a lot of kudos from me Not to you, wood. brother. Not and just keep it Thank going. You. Thank you, man. And what I want to comment on is that there is no way, after watching 30 for 30, there is no way any of these guys could even contend, could be on the same court with these guys, man. And I wish people would stop trying to compare them with these guys and those guys with these guys. There's no way the files that they gave back in the day, there's no way these guys would even last. Yeah, they I should mean, please stop trying to compare these guys. Well, I think there's something to that. And Coach, I appreciate the call. But on the other side of it, uh, Clay Thompson has got the clamps on just about anybody that you're throwing out from back in the day. The way I think that you have to do it with those sorts of things is you got to imagine. So if I dropped Magic Johnson off in 2017 and gave him all the advantages that you have, then would he, what would he turn into? Like, that's the only way I think that you can do it. Because, I mean, look, players physically evolve, right? It's all like, Players now are certainly more talented than ever. But you're not going to tell me that if I give, like, take Elgin Baylor from back in the day and put him here, that he ain't going to get it right. 888-729-3776. This is up to Dave. Dave, thanks for calling the right time. Oh, money! you're talking about all the white dudes on the Celtics, and you're right, but you're leaving out Dennis Johnson, <laughs> who is as white as any black dude could be. What? He was what? He was as white as any black dude could be as far as a great basketball player. He was a defense first guy. And by the way, he was on that Celtics or uh, Sonics team that you just mentioned. You said, can we remember any of the Sonics from the 79 championship team? DJ was part of that team, too. So, like, do you think he was whiter than Lenny Wilkins or something? Because he was on that team, too. Like, like how did you how did you come Lenny to this? Lenny Wilkins rel- was a coach, wasn't he? Yeah, I think he played on it also. But how did you come to this, like, relative scale of whiteness that made Dennis Johnson white because he played defense? Oh, well, he wasn't exactly. Uh, I mean, I mean, was Michael Cooper white? Not at all. Okay, he was pretty defense first, too. Thanks for nothing, Dave. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. All guests join us on the Shell Penzo performance line, just like our next guest. If you watch Around the Horn, you might see her beating me from time to time. She also wrote a book on Magic Johnson and Larry Bird called When the Game Was Ours. Her name is Jackie McMullen. Now, Jackie, you are a native New Englander. So for you growing up, how big was this Celtics-Lakers rivalry? Oh, it was huge. And, you know, as a young writer, Bomani, I, I was lucky enough to go to the Globe right out of college. And I just kept thinking, when do I get to be in? When do I get to be part of this, right? So I graduated from college in 1982. So I missed 81, missed the 81 championship that the Celtics won. But then it got to the mid-80s, and I'm like, how do I get in on this? Because it was, it was the biggest thing in town. And of course, today's world, everybody thinks is New England as the New England Patriots. Well, they were just horrid. They were horrible. Nobody cared about the Patriots back then. It was all about the Celtics, and specifically all about the Celtics and the Lakers. There was a genuine, genuine hatred between the two teams, the players, and especially the fans. So you're telling me Bob Ryan wouldn't give up his seat and it made it harder for you to get in there? Is that the thing? <laughs> Bob was pretty nice to me, but I was just so young and so green. I had to wait my turn like everybody else, you know? All right, we are talking to Jackie McMullen on the right time. So for you, because I think there's, there's interesting, there's like basically two phases of this that are really big, right? The 1960s, which is the Lakers never winning and the Celtics walking over them right. every year. And then the 1980s where the Lakers finally got over the hump and we saw the fall of the Celtics dynasty really kind of starting when Lynn Bias died. So for you, what do you think is the most interesting period of this? Well, I think is I mean, for me, again, because I lived it, because I started covering it, was the late 80s. I mean, people the other day were asking me, well, so what's the most memorable Celtics-Lakers championship series? And everybody expects you to say 84, right? Because that's the one that the, the Celtics really steal from the Lakers, and the, that's where tragic magic comes and all that. But for me, my body, it was really 1987, and the reason for that is because up until then, you know, in 86, the Celtics were unstoppable. I still think that's one of the greatest teams of all time. Bill Walton jumped into the Wayback Machine, had a great year with the six man. They drafted Len Bias, as you said, and they had this young player named Reggie Lewis who was coming along. And you thought, my God, this is never going to end because not only do you have these great players in their prime, but now you have the two bridge players in place in Len Bias and Reggie Lewis. Now, just think about that for a minute. This, this could go on for a whole other decade. Instead, Walton gets hurt, never plays in 87. Kevin McHale plays the 1987 finals with a broken foot. 
all the way through, even though doctors told him, if you keep playing on this, it's going to hurt you down the line. He played all through that series with a broken foot. Then, of course, Magic just slays them with that junior, junior hook all against all, all three of the best guys in the, in the front line in basketball at that time. And then after that, it all falls apart for Bird. He has heat, double heel surgery. He has back problems. The Celtics are never the same, and they never get back to the finals. Now, if you had told me in 1987, I covered that entire series, that we would never see Magic's Lakers and Bird's Celtics play each other again for a championship, I would have told you you were nuts. But that's exactly what happened. Well, would you like to join me in the Kevin McHale Appreciation Society? Because oh. I feel like he's – Celtics have two players I feel this way about. One of them's is Check, The other one is Kevin McHale, where I don't even right. know that much about Havlicek, but I can read the numbers and tell how good he was. And McHale, I try to explain to younger people, like, no, really, like that guy might have been the oh, best yeah. power forward ever up until the time that he played. Right. And, you know, I'm the president of that fan club. And, and again, the other thing that people talked about, we always heard about Bird showing up early and there was great footage of Bird, you know, shooting alone in that gym for hours upon end, putting in the time. But I'm telling you, I was there. Kevin McHale did the same damn thing. He just did it at different times of day when nobody saw him do it. He was one of the greatest athletes I've ever seen. He was so uh, disinterested in being a superstar. He just didn't care. And of course, there's the famous score story when he scored the 50 plus points and Bird said, ah, you should have scored more and went out and beat him, you know, a few nights later, because that was Bird's mentality. It was never McHale's mentality. And I would say that that's true Bamani now in retirement. They've been trying to honor McHale here in Boston for over a decade for some of the stuff he's done. And he just says, hey, thanks. I love my time in Boston. He's just not interested from beginning to end he was a a boy from Hibby, minnesota who remembered where he came from who cared the most about his family he just doesn't care about all the other stuff around it and i think sometimes that hurts you when it comes time for history to remember you all right we are talking to jackie mcmullen on the right time now thinking about those 80s teams how much did magic johnson just he himself change what this rivalry was well, he did. And, you know, how about just the growth of Magic Johnson to begin with? You know, in 1980, 19, the 1980 championship, plays every position, jump center. We all know about all that. And we think, well, this kid's just the greatest thing we've ever seen. And then in 84, they play the, the, the Lakers come in, they play the Celtics, and he, he chokes. He'll be the first to tell you that. He dribbles out the uh, clock. He misses some big free throws. And everybody's like, whoa, did we prop this guy up too high? Is he not really what we thought he was? And the night they lost, they lost in Boston. He sat in his hotel room with his two close friends, Mark Aguirre and Isaiah Thomas, who two of his closest friends, and they ordered some food, and they sat up there in, the, in the, I think it was the Four Seasons Hotel and looked out at, at this, huge, this huge crowd celebrating this wonderful championship. And, uh, you know, in talking to both Aguirre and Isaiah Thomas about that night, they said, we would have bet the house that Magic Johnson was going to win one for the Lakers the next year. And, of course, that's exactly what happened. And I think, again, one of the significant things about 87 was after that series was over and Magic made that, among other shots, the junior, junior hook and many other things, what Larry Bird said after that series. Now, Larry Bird had a genuine dislike for the Lakers. I don't know that he disliked Magic personally, but he was his foil. He checked the box scores every morning. You know, he wanted to beat him. He wanted to be better than him. But then in 1987, when that series is over, he said, you just watched the best player in basketball. It's almost like he conceded, you know, and uh, and I think that Irvin, I, Pat Riley, I thought it was interesting, said the other day he thinks he's the greatest player of all time. And I can understand why someone who was around him would think that because as, as, as good as he was on the court, he was everybody as good as that off the court. He was just an infectious personality that kept people upbeat, that kept them positive and that made everyone feel included. And those are special qualities in a player. Well, I think you just kind of touched inadvertently on an interesting dynamic in that Magic Bird rivalry that we forget is that they hit the league in the same year. But Larry Bird was three years older than him. Like he was much more a grown man when he got into the league. Because the way you say Larry Bird saying that, it almost sounds like he recognized at that point that, yeah, this guy has reached that point and I'm probably as good as I'm going to be. Yeah, I think that's probably right. And I think also, too, Bird knew his body was start his own body was starting to break down. But he saw a a growth and a maturity in, in Irvin that, well, I guess the rest of the world saw, but I think Larry understood it a little more implicitly. Remember now, they were teammates on this uh, this kind of made-up college all-star international team. It was a made-for-TV event, and they played on that together. And, you know, Magic was on the bus playing his boombox. You know, he's got his arm around everybody, and Larry 
sitting in the corner and won't talk to anybody. And yet during that time, they were both on the second team because Joby Hall refused to play them. You know, they, they were better than some of the starters. He was playing, he was too busy playing his own Kentucky guys. <laughs> and, and they de- developed this friendship and this bond. And Magic thought, well, this will last forever. So when they play each other in the national championship, the very next year of the college national championship, he goes up ready to give Bird, you know, a big hug and a big hello. And Bird walks right past him because his mentality always was, if you're not with me, you're against me. And believe me when I tell you, he held firm to that from start to finish of his career. And Irvin, I think, probably enjoyed it a little more than Larry did because he, he liked everybody around him. Aguirre and Isaiah Thomas, they were threats to him, but he never let it stop him from being friends with them and opening up his world to them. We are talking to Jackie McMullen on the right time. And I guess if we're Bird and Magic, it, could it have been possible that there were ever two guys who were better for time and place in the teams that they wound up on? The Celtics were down. Larry Bird comes in. I think they improved by like 25 right. games or something like that. And Magic just seemed made for L.A. Right. And they really, you know, because Bird was lunch bucket, you know, dive for loose balls, uh, physical player, and fit the city, you know, the grind and the grit of Boston. And, and Magic was showtime, the glitz and the glamour of L.A. And, of course, the two of them together – uh, because David Stern was no dummy, he saw what he saw, and he said, you know, yes, rivalries are nice, but our league's about people, our league's about stars. And that's when they promoted the two of them, and then, of course, the famous Converse basketball shoe commercial. All those stars were aligned to make the two of them the epicenter of really, I think you could, I don't think it's hyperbole to say they really saved the league, because in earlier years, as you remember, Mamani, the, the, the NBA, everyone's like, well, they're all on drugs, and, uh, and all they do is shoot. And then Larry and Magic came in, and they wanted to pass first. So they not only changed the image of the game, they also changed the way the game was played. All right, Jackie McMullen. She is the author, by the way, of When the Game Was Ours, a book on Magic Johnson and Larry Bird that you should check out. We also have a 30 for 30 that we're showing on this network that you should check out also. Jackie, thanks so much. I appreciate it. All right, Bomani. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. On the line with us now, this gentleman is now an NBA champion. His name is David West, man. How those two? How, how have these two days felt for you? Man, they feel. <laughs> Damn, we go through all that to get David West and lost him that quick. Speechless. He sounded so happy, though, right? Like he already sounded so happy with what's going on. That's the thing. David West so happy, he accidentally hung up the phone. Kind of like that time I got so bad on a phone call with a girlfriend I was breaking up with, I accidentally hit off and never actually got around to the breakup. My bad. That was a long time ago, though. The button was right by my cheekbone on the zygomaticus. And it just went that way. I'm just killing time until we get David West back. <laughs> Janet, this is the worst when this happens, by the way. Things happen, though, with, they with, do. with cell phones. Oh, no, no, no. They, they totally do happen. Like, it's nobody's fault. I'm just letting people know as the host it gets tricky. But there we have. David West is back with us, man. How have these last two days been? Great, man. Can't complain, man. Just enjoying it, taking it all in. Well, I know for a lot of people, and you know, a lot has been made out of this, that you opted out of that contract with Indiana to go play for the Spurs for a better chance at a championship, and now here. And I feel like a lot of people look at you like Dave Chappelle. Like, how do you walk away from that much money? I mean, you know, you, you got to know who you are. You know what I'm saying? I've, we prepared, um, you know, in a great way early on and always talked about toward the end of my career. I just wanted to make decisions that were based about basketball. I didn't want to be forced to have to make decisions solely uh, financial. Um, and so it just – it wasn't that hard. You know what I'm saying? I, I feel like there are a lot of things that we do uh, sometimes that, you know, are greater than, you know, the monetary gain and things that you can get from it. And, and basketball has always been one of those things for me. So uh, it wasn't a problem for me, man. And, and again, I don't look at, at the world or look at myself as like this this entity that's only capable of uh, putting the ball through a hoop, you know. So I got a lot of life left, uh, a lot of – a lot of more things to do. So, Well, I'm also wondering, was it attractive for you to, like, with Indiana, you had to be the grown-up. Like, was it attractive to go to teams that had other grown-ups there already? Yeah, it was great, man. Just going into high-level high, high level environments, you know what I'm saying, uh, environments where, you know, guys are just about winning, preparing the right way, and then obviously you have that great talent um, and guys who just want to be productive when uh, when the opportunity presents itself. All right, we are talking to David West on the right time. Now, you know we got to ask you about the thing with Tristan Thompson, man, because I feel like once two dudes get that close to each other, y'all both really want to back up, but you can't back up. Like, at some point, did you realize, man, my lips are right next to this other dude's lips? Look, man, I was uh, that was a very intense moment. But, <laughs> I, uh, you know, honestly, you don't even remember stuff like that, you know. Um, more than anything, Danny Crawford, 
um, he's a real MVP of that of that moment because he he caught my left hand, um, <laughs> and uh, he <laughs> we talked about that. Uh, he he saved me and allowed me to stay in the game uh, because um, you know that was an intense moment. I felt like they were trying to you know cross that line and do what other you know teams have tried to do to this team in the past and just beat them up and be physical with them. Um, you know, but we were here for that response, and I thought that that helped us, you know, maintain our focus going down the stretch. Well, are you one of the last tough guys left? Because we were talking about this about the NBA. There aren't that many guys left in the league that the first thing you think about when you see them is that that is a tough dude, but you're one of those guys on that list. Yeah, I mean, it is what it is, you know. Uh, you know, when I came in the NBA, man, I remember you couldn't even wear stuff on your hands because guys would target where you were injured, you know what I'm saying? Um, and a lot of the guys that I learned the game from were guys that played all through the 90s. So um, it's just a different time, a different era of basketball. Uh, you know, and it's just something that I learned at an early, early age that, you know, you always got to be ready to to jump. All right, we are talking to David West on the right time. So for you joining this team where all the guys had already been there, what was the most surprising thing to you to learn about that roster once you were a part of it? I think we lost David West again, guys. It's really disappointing. But it's better than Keith Hernandez, Shannon, where you had to pretend to be Keith Hernandez. Right, actually, and, and then we have David West, who actually sounds like he wanted to be on the show with us, so we greatly appreciate it. <laughs> Which is a great difference for that time that we had Keith Hernandez on. I, I do wonder, though, he said that Danny Crawford saved them with the left hand. Like, did he save David West from not being kicked out, or did he save Tristan Thompson? <laughs> that is a fair question. I think it's one we might ask, assuming that, you know, we get David West back. Uh, by the way, the right time is brought to you by Pennzoil Synthetics, taking synthetic motor oil performance to a whole new level. Make the switch to Pennzoil Synthetics today. I thought about, too, I said about the, the hey, but so many tough guys left in the NBA. They got David West and Matt Barnes. Hey, everybody focuses on, hey, you, know, you won 73 regular season games and you go out and, and add KD. Oh, no, let's not focus on that. That's the shiny object in the room. <laughs> they went and got them some tough dudes. Right, David West and Matt Barnes, NBA champion. Like, th- that is where – now, granted, they had Matt Barnes before who was on a team with the Warriors that I think was a bit more Matt Barnesy. But, all right, we got David West back on the line with us here on the right time. Um, so with this team, I was just wondering, like, when you joined them, like, was there anything that was surprising to you when you became a part of that group? I mean, other than the fact that these guys are like, you know, they they're, they're still gym rat, um, and you know how loose, you know, just the gym is in general. Um, I mean, you could come into the gym. The, the probably the one thing is that it probably makes older coaches, folks who have a more traditional view of the game, um, it probably makes them a little uncomfortable if they were to come into one of the practices, um, just because of how loose it is, but. The thing is that these guys are gym rats, you know. Because the environment is so loose and so welcoming, guys are constantly in the gym working. Well, is that a thing you had to get used to? Because I know Mike Brown said the hardest thing for him is getting used to the fact that, you know, they're not calling a lot of plays. Yeah, I mean, that's just a part of just a part of the way Steve does it. I mean, he wants, you know, the talent of of, uh, of the team to show, uh, but he just tries to keep it, you know, constrained and confined at, at different moments. But what makes these guys great is just the ability to play on the fly and improvise and uh, and be other world type talents. All right, we are talking to David West on the right time. Uh, your teammate Steph Curry earlier talked to Mark Spears a little bit about the White House. We had a false report that you guys had voted about whether or not you were going to go to the White House. Is it too early for us to ask you guys about your intentions on that? Yeah, we haven't even gotten together as a group uh, since halftime of the championship game. Uh, game five, but we don't. We haven't spoken as a group, uh, up there or made a group decision. I don't even know how they got out there like that. All right, well, moving on, talking about the parade, which I think is coming up tomorrow. Which dude on the team do you think is the one that's going to act the craziest at this parade? Uh, I don't know. I have no idea. If I if I was a red man, my money be on number twenty three. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but. But I don't know. I think everybody's gonna be pretty excited. Uh it was a it was a it was a heck of a journey this year. Uh we had a, a fun time doing it, you know what I'm saying? And we're gonna enjoy winning it. I feel like my money's on JaVale McGee. Like I feel like once you got the rat tail, there's no telling what's gonna come next. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about JaVale. Yeah, Vale gonna be out there. Well he I wonder be, be 
Well, I wonder about that joining a team with JaVale McGee because I kind of felt bad for him through this year because we're kind of holding him to the standard of what he was in 2011, and now he's JaVale McGee, NBA champion. Like, from your year around him, are we in the media too hard on him? I, I don't know if you're too I just know, the, you know, what he is is not what is then sort of projected out there about him. You know what I'm saying? Like, the one thing that threw me off is, like, the dude is informed. You know what I'm saying? Like, he knows. And, I I mean, I'm not, I'm just taking it from what, you know, what I've seen from a distance. Like, the dude is really informed. Like, he knows what's going on, like, every single day. Um, you know, kind of the, the hot button social issues or whatever. He's pretty in tune with that stuff, which is not what you would, um, you know, if you didn't know him or get a chance to get up to him. You know what I'm saying? Well, look, just tell him that Poppy or Holly Questionable is his biggest fan because he gets mad at our show for laughing at him, and his biggest fan is sitting right there. Right, right. That's what's up. I will. <laughs> All right, man. That's David West, NBA champion. But, man, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Appreciate you, man. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. So now we're at the point where we're looking at the future for the teams in the NBA Finals because otherwise we'd be up here talking about baseball. Anyway, uh, the Warriors. Who we got? Sean Livingston, free agent this offseason. Andre Iguodala, free agent, this offseason. Kevin Durant, kind of sort of free agent, this offseason. And Steph Curry, at least in theory, free agent, this offseason. Now, what is interesting about the way that the um, Warriors are put together is, number one, who has ever made more magic with mid-lottery, like, second-round picks or whatever it is? Like, they made the magic happen with number 7 pick Steph Curry, number 11 pick Klay Thompson, number 35 pick Draymond Green. And I had somebody hit me, and they were like, yeah, man, well, you're supposed to hit on the number 7 pick. No, 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 no. Uh, Tom Haverstraw of ESPN once did a column on the expected value of each pick, and he basically said what you can expect from the number 7 pick is Tom Gugliotta, and what you can expect from the number le- number 11 pick it's Tyrone Hill, right? It's Tyrone Hill. They got Steph Curry and Klay Thompson at 7 and 11. They got Draymond Green at 35. And then you carry that over. They got Steph Curry for $11 million. Like, they had a fascinating confluence of circumstances that allowed them to put this team together, including the decision by the NBA Players Association to not do cap smoothing. Basically, when the TV money came in, the cap jumped immediately rather than going up gradually. They took that bird in the hand over that bird, over them two in the bush, right? They got it right there, and then that allowed the Warriors to add Kevin Durant. There's a lot that had to break there. Like a lot of it was a lot of it was being good, a lot of it was good luck. And you ain't got to turn either one of those away if you're in that situation, right? But that's where they wound up. Now it gets to be interesting on how exactly do you keep this thing together? Because Igodala, yeah, what well, Igodala played well over 30 minutes in game five. Well over. Why? Because he's their guy they figured that could guard LeBron, except once you get Kevin Durant, Igodala is not <laughs> That cuts into the minutes. Like Harrison Barnes, okay, he could be a starter, but you play Iguodala more. Okay, we got Kevin Durant. This is a different ball game. Sean Livingston, who is such an interesting piece to have because he's, in effect, a 6'8 point guard. He can only really come off the bench, but there's nobody that you're going to put out there to guard him who can actually guard him. Like, it stops mattering the fact that he cannot shoot. Right? He's like an 18% for three-point shooter or something like that. Like, that fact stops mattering. But all these guys now are talking about Kevin Durant says he'll take a little bit less than the max in order to – bring Iguodala back. He said he'll take less than a max in order to bring Sean Livingston back. Guys, guess who I ain't heard a word from about giving up anything on his contract? (laughs) That would be Steph Curry. Steph Curry to new LeBron, right? Where LeBron was like, look, after all this time of not being the highest paid player in the league, I'm about to be that as often as possible. That is going to be me. Steph Curry is like, no, 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 you got all my discounts. You got by. Like, every assumption that people have about Steph Curry and his unselfishness, I'm not saying he's selfish. I'm saying he ain't giving back to Max. No, he he qualifies for the Supermax, right? The five-year, $200 million deal. Every dime. Every dime. Definitely makes, what, 12 mil? Mm Mm-hmm. And did you see that Joe Lacob um, said that they'll do whatever it takes to keep Steph happy and to keep him? But you notice he didn't say, we'll give Steph the Max. As if he's crossing his fingers and hoping that Steph's going to come in and be like, I just wanted to let y'all know that I'm going to take a little bit less than the max. 
I, I, honestly, I can't blame him. I don't think anyone should. And you look at what Steph's played for throughout his career. He's played well under his value. Once he really started go, mm-hmm. getting it going, he played under his value for it, a lot of the years. It's like the most affor- it's like the most affordable contract in the history of the NBA because they got him cheap in his prime, right? This isn't like they got a guy cheap on his rookie deal. They got him cheap in his prime. They were so fortunate in that regard. And I like I want to see what happens when this all goes with this idea of I'll give up some money off of my contract in order to sign these guys. Well, let's see what the rest of the league is talking about giving these guys, right? Like, let's see what everybody else is trying to offer them, and then we'll see just how much anybody is actually trying to give back. Because then I got I don't think they have a hard time keeping this team together now. Because I think even if you lose Sean Livingston, I think you can find somebody else that can do like Sean Livingston like things. I think even if you lose Iguodala, there's a chance that you can find somebody who does that. The fun's going to start in 2019 when that Clay Thompson deal comes up. And Clay Thompson, it is entirely possible, will be in line for one of those $40 million deals. Draymond, $40 million a year deals. Draymond Green, the following year, it is entirely possible he'll be in line for one of those $40 million a year deals. And I'm sorry, I ain't giving none of that back. No, no, no. Like in or- It feels like in order for those guys to give money back to make it worth it, on, for the cap and everything else, they wouldn't just be giving up like the handful of million that Kevin Durant is willing to give up. And I, look, I ain't here to tell anybody that three, four million dollars isn't a lot of money. I'm just saying for Kevin Durant, his his the end of his life, if you subtract four million dollars, I don't think very much changes if you have that. But I don't think Draymond and Clay Thompson are gonna take twenty five instead of forty. At least I wouldn't. Hell no. Are you kidding me? And that's where it's interesting, though, because the whole thing about this is you want to make it so that the home team can pay more, right? Because if the home team can pay more, then you retain guys. The problem is that the home team got too many guys to try to pay. What do you do? And I think by, by the time we get to that point, everyone's going to understand if one of those guys decides to walk, hey, or if the Golden State decides to let him go, I think it's going to be understood. Hey, we had our run. Go get your money. We can't deny you from trying to make the most money you could possibly make. And like you said, these guys, it'd be one thing if you're sacrificing a couple mil, but to sacrifice 10 to 15 mil a year, who's going to do that? Well, what we have to find out and what I don't think we have any answer for is what is Joe Lacob's appetite for the luxury tax, right? So that was one of the things in Oklahoma City was that they did not want to pay the luxury tax. Dan Gilbert in Cleveland, no problem paying the luxury tax. Because when you got LeBron, it's just money hand over fist. But remember, this is about Joe Lacob. They're moving into that new arena. What is it, 2020 that they're moving into that new arena? You might want to show up with Clay Thompson and Draymond Green, right? Like, that's a thought. So what is his appetite for the luxury tax? Yeah, he's rich. Let me tell you something about rich people. They don't get rich by giving their money away. I think that's a fair point to make, right? Like, let's think about rich people. Just because they rich people are not known for just giving money to people especially not the ones that work for them. The Chase Center will open in the 2019-20 season. So 2019, right after Clay Thompson's deal is up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this thing ain't going to break up in 2018. I don't think it breaks up in 2019. But it's going to be interesting to see how it goes with that tax. Once that comes up, how much is Lacob willing to do to keep everybody together? And to be honest, if you broke the whole thing up, I got no... I, how can I be mad at him, right? I'm not paying, I'm not trying to pay if I'm him, what, like a dollar fifty, a dollar seventy five for one dollar. And to your point earlier, really quickly, I'll, I'll look this up. The players drafted at the seventh pick after Steph Curry. So Curry was drafted seventh in 09. Greg Monroe, Biz McBiambo, Harrison Barnes, Ben McElmore, Julius Randle, Emmanuel Moutier, and Jamal Murray. Yeah, I feel like they got their money's worth out of the number seven pick. Thanks to David Kahn and the Minnesota Timberwolves for not having any idea what they're doing. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Guys, been trying to, I've been talking about this. I've been saying for the longest that it's a really, really, really bad idea. But apparently nobody wants to listen to me. We have had updates on the social media. We got them from both fighters. Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather are going to have a boxing match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one guy, the best boxer of his era, will be facing another guy who isn't a boxer. And y'all are going to watch. Y'all are going to watch. You know, the worst thing about the fact is that y'all are going to watch because y'all are going to watch. That means I got to watch. Why I got to watch? Because this is going to wind up being big. Now, I have told you guys, I feel as though... A Floyd Mayweather, Conor McGregor fight is going to tear America apart at a time when America is frayed. 
right? I, I feel like we as Americans will love each other in the ways that we should love each other. We do not. We, we, we should love each other a little bit more, and we do not. And I don't feel like this is going to help build the love. I just do not. Why do I not feel like this is going to help build the love? I don't feel like it's going to help build the love because we are dealing with at least one person who traffics in race baiting to promote fights, and that is Floyd Mayweather. Now, the thing is, normally with Floyd Mayweather, when he's doing that, it's against Mexicans. His daddy, Roger Mayweather, refers to himself as the Mexican assassin. Remember that in 24-7? He called himself the Mexican assassin because of the way he'd be killing the Mexicans while they're boxing. And I'm like, yo, that can't be your nickname. That, 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 that also sounds like a great way to get hit in the head with a bottle uh, coming out to the ring. But that, like, that is it. Floyd plays that game. There's a reason why Floyd stayed having them fights in Vegas on Cinco de Mayo weekend against somebody speaking Spanish. If they couldn't find a Mexican, they'd pass an Argentinian off in front of you and just say that he was Mexican. Right. Like that. That is what he does. He traffics in this all the time. I don't follow enough UFC to know if Connor really traffics in that. Necess- well, I actually know he did refer to the homie and Nate Diaz that time is just a cholo from the hood. Guys, that's how they sell fights. That's how fights get sold. It's worked from the beginning of time. They have made movies about these things. And given that this is nothing but a clown show, and look, there's no way to refer to this as anything other than a clown show because there's no reason for anybody to believe that Conor McGregor has a chance to beat Floyd Mayweather. None. None. Uh, Let me get a look here. We got some of these odds in this fight. You know how much money you got to put down to make like a dime betting off Floyd Mayweather? It is ridiculously difficult. Yeah, Floyd Mayweather is a negative 1,100 favorite at Westgate. Negative 1,100. May May 30th, Westgate took a $50,000 bet on Mayweather. That was at negative 800, okay? If you put down 50 grand at negative 800, you get back $6,250. This is going to shock you, by the way. 92% of the bets as of now are on McGregor. A, that's the only way that you can make any money. And B, there's going to be a lot of wishful thinking as we come across this fight. I feel like as this fight gets closer and closer, y'all need to watch the great white hype. The movie, The Great White Hype, directed by the brilliant uh, Hudlin Brothers. And then that way, once you do that, you can get yourself an education on exactly how this fight promotion is going to go. The difference is, at least this time, the Irish guy is actually Irish. Now, how many people go become Irish in the buildup to this fight? How many? How many? Because when I think about it, man, they are real good at making you believe that this underdog has a chance to win. Real good. And, and all you got to do is have not even an emotional attachment to somebody, but just some reason to believe. Some reason at all to believe. So I'll give you an example. Who remembers when Mike Tyson fought Lennox Lewis? Mike Tyson fought Lennox Lewis. I already forgot the year, but he fought him in Memphis, right? By the way, I love the thought. Heavyweight championship fight in Memphis. But Mike Tyson fought Lennox Lewis in Memphis and we'd seen Mike bite Holyfield's ear off. We'd seen Mike didn't really have it anymore. Mike wasn't the guy that we had seen in the past. But you could not convince me that Mike didn't have a chance to win that fight against Lewis Lewis. Mike went out there in the first round, and it was like, okay, Mike ain't going to win this fight. But you couldn't tell me that. I think Mike has got a chance. I think Mike has got a chance. It was 2002. I think Mike got a chance. I think Mike got a chance. Because you will convince yourselves of these things. How many people are going to trick themselves into believing that Conor McGregor can win this fight? against Floyd Mayweather. Are you going to trick yourself into that? Like, I just want to know. And, by the way, if you cannot trick yourself into believing that Floyd Mayweather will lose to Conor McGregor, why are you ordering the fight? Like, the expectation is that this is going to get more pay-per-view buys than Mayweather Pacquiao. Now, granted, we got Mayweather Pacquiao way after we actually wanted it, but we got it, and Pacquiao is a real, live, actual boxer. McGregor, like, I mean, this isn't what he does. This isn't it. But it'll make for some dope press conferences. McGregor's as good on the mic. Is there anybody outside of wrestling as good on the mic as Conor McGregor? This guy, is Conor McGregor the best person on the mic since The Rock? Right? Like, we've had, I think we interviewed Conor McGregor three or four times on Highly Question, but I'd never heard of him before the first time because I don't really do that UFC. I, you know, no beef. I'm not throwing any shade on your little game. I just don't really pay attention to it. And I just sat there like, wow, okay, this guy is great. And on top of it, accent. Accents make everything better. Accents make everything better. But it's going to tear America apart. And by the way, the fight is on August 26th, which is my birthday. Because that's how Floyd repays me. 
after all this warning I gave to everybody that I don't feel like this fight is going to be good for people. Um, you can watch the Rocky movies, see how fights go on these ethnic lines. I don't feel like this is going to bring us together at a time where I think we need to come together. And they're like, okay, Bomani, how about we have this fight on your birthday? Which means that on my birthday, somebody going to try to get me to come to the Conor McGregor, Floyd Mayweather fight party. And if they're looking right in there, I'm going to come. Regardless of the uh, the atmosphere, you, you you good? Whoa, whoa, whoa! Hold on, hold on a second. Now you're talking about regardless of the atmosphere. You know damn well that I ain't trying to watch this fight in no mixed company. You know this. I do not think that watching boxing matches that are going to trade in the fair that this is going to trade in in mixed company is a good idea. I told you about when my homeboy went to Vegas for Mayweather De La Hoya. And he said he was watching it in one of those theaters and something happened and some black dude got into it with some Mexican cats and the Mexican cats started stomping the black dude out. I asked my man, what'd you do? He said, Psh, I got out the way. I didn't want them to think I was with him. No, 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 no. In fact, yeah, Pete, you could, we, we ought to, we, we should have, if we had a chance, we could put this out there for people to call. About that time you watched a boxing match in a place where you should not have watched a boxing match. My man Vic and Raleigh talks about uh, it was Trinidad and, ooh, I forget who Trinidad was fighting. Uh, oh, Hopkins. Hopkins and Trinidad. And he said he lived in a Puerto Rican neighborhood. He said it was no fun the day after that fight. No fun. He said they were coming up on him, and they're like, yeah, I bet you're happy that your guy won. He's like, look, man, I'm just trying to buy this soda. Like, that's all I'm trying to do is buy this soda and get out of here. Nothing good is coming. Now, Nuno suggests we should have a right time viewing party for some of our. Li- no, 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 because I can't invite everybody. No, that'll be the wrong time. I can't invite everybody. Last thing I need is somebody saying the wrong thing to me. All right, 888 729 Stacy in Brooklyn. Stacy, what's going on? Yo, yo, what's up, Bo? What's up, Shannon? Man, Bo, I've been, I've been pining for several days to call in because I had some things I had to get off my chest, but. Ah oh, man, I can't resist this opportunity, man, because I'm I'm sitting here frothing at the mouth, man, at the possibility of this debacle taking place here in the next year or so or whatever. But uh, I guess I'll get to the other stuff at some other time. But right now, man, you cannot be in mixed company to watch this fight, man. If it does take place, you need to be where your allegiances are tight because anything can go off with something like this, man. You remember that story, Mexican joint, La Ranchero back in the day, De La Hoya, Mayweather? Mm-hmm. Not De La Hoya Mayweather. It was uh, Bernard Hopkins versus De La Hoya. And he took that body shot. Yeah. We were surrounded. We were the only two brothers in the spot. And early in the evening, the Cerveza, everything was flowing, man. Every day, everybody was having a good time. He took that liver shot, dropped him. All of a sudden, people started speaking in their own dialect. And my <laughs> Spanish was limited at the time. Next thing you know, put it his way. My boy jumped in my truck, hopped the curb in the Walgreens parking lot. We ran. People yelling out the windows at us, and that was all she wrote, man. We had to get up out of there. I ended up with a flat tire, but my <laughs> safety my safety was of the utmost importance at that time, man. And, like, ever since then, I learned a valuable lesson. You know party lines are drawn in a situation like that, man. So you know for damn sure that I'm not. This situation is the tale of two Americas, man. You cannot be in mixed company, man. Unfortunately, you like to have a camaraderie, hope it's a melting pot, everybody can get along, but you know. The lines are gonna be drawn, man. I mean, like it's gonna be, it's gonna be houses divided and everything, man. Yeah, see, divided. I, yeah, see, I don't know how many houses are gonna be divided. Uh, Stacy, I appreciate the call. No, I feel like houses are gonna be united, right? Houses are not gonna be divided. The question is gonna be what happens when you go to somebody else's house. The right time with Bomani Jones. On the line with us. Check him out on the breakdown on Showtime Sports. Love to talk to him about boxing. Also had a part in a little thing called the Morning Jones that's near and dear to my heart. His name is Corey Erdman. All right, Corey, we thought this fight would never happen because we thought no sanctioning body would ever allow Mayweather McGregor to happen. How in the hell is this happening? I have no idea. You know, R- Ralph Tresvant made a whole career out of singing about how he wasn't going to date women. I thought that this fight would turn out the same way. It would be a whole lot of promises, <laughs> and it would all fall apart. I, I mean, this is uh, – and, and I've known for a little while that this was probably going to happen. You know, I, I first heard it a couple weeks ago, and even at that point, even being in the company, still didn't believe that it was going to happen. But – you know, I, I guess we've answered the question about whether or not you're going to be able to make it to my wedding, Bo. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to make it to my own wedding. It's on that day. That's right. It's my birthday and it's your wedding day. It's the worst. 
<laughs> so I, what's, I, what is there to reasonably expect here? One guy is a boxer, one guy is not, but they are going to box. If, if it's a boxing match, and, and, and I've said this all along, uh, even predating my employment with, with Showtime, and I'm not going to waver on it just because I work for the company, but if this is a fully sanctioned boxing match, this fight ends as quickly as Floyd Mayweather wants it to end. If, if he wants it to be over in the first 20 seconds, he can make that happen. It, it, but it, if, it's, if it's something else, if it's some kind of exhibition, if they have headgear on, like that one uh, Mike Tyson pay-per-view against Corey Sanders many years ago where they were just sparring in T-shirts, I mean, I, I, the only thing we don't know is how this fight will actually look. But if it is a boxing match as we know them to be, then unless Floyd is carrying him, this fight ends whenever he feels like it. We are talking to Corey Erdman of Showtime Sports. Now, the idea of Floyd in this fight whenever he wants to, I guess he feel like, felt like that a long time because we never actually see Floyd knock anybody out. Like, do you think he could knock Conor McGregor out? Oh, 100%. Yeah, absolutely you can. And, I mean, again, we are talking about someone who has never received a punch in the face from a professional boxer, let alone the, the, the greatest professional boxer of this generation, and, and and he's going to step in there and, and take it from Floyd Mayweather. I mean, listen, Floyd could knock the vast majority of people on planet Earth out, and he could knock the vast majority of professional fighters out as well. We've been seeing Floyd against the other best professional fighters in the world, professional boxers, excuse me. So, yeah, he hasn't been scoring a whole lot of knockouts in recent years, but that doesn't mean that the man can't punch. All right, we're talking to Corey Erdman of Showtime Sports here on the right time. Now, for McGregor, I mean, is there anything to get out of this other than money? Like, I'm a little confused. I'm actually shocked that Dana White went along with this. But for McGregor, is there anything other than money? Well, I mean, there's a lot of money, but there's also nothing to lose. I mean, he could – and, and the, the dollar figures being thrown around – are baffling right now. And, and I don't know that it's necessarily going to be true that Conor is going to make $100 million because uh, if you look at his career high purse in the UFC, I think his career high purse is something like $3 million. So that's a gargantuan leap, even accounting for you know the, the status of his opponent and the colossal risk that he's going to take physically fighting in a sport that he's never fought in. Um, but for him, I mean, who cares? Like, if he does get knocked out by Floyd Mayweather in 20 seconds, then he can say, I went to a sport I've never participated in before. I took on the best of the generation and I lost. And then he can go back to the UFC with a whole lot of money or never fight again. I mean, this is, this is life-changing money and a life-changing event for Conor McGregor, win or lose. Now, how do you think this is going to go for the UFC fans who always tell us that boxing is dead? <laughs> well, I mean, it, 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 in fact, it will probably give them fuel because they will argue that it's Conor McGregor that is making this a, a big event. When in, in reality, I mean, this is Floyd's promotion. It's on Showtime. The reason that Conor will make north of the $3 million career high purse that he's made in the past is because he's fighting Floyd Mayweather. So, I mean, it, they, they will spin it the way that they want to, but the reality is that the UFC still to this day tries to co-opt boxing and boxing success or the history of boxing to promote its fighters and its brand. And there's really no way around that, and this is, you know, the, the ultimate example of that. I'm talking to Corey Yardman to Showtime Sports on the right time. And I feel like the part that gets lost in this is that no matter what you think about boxing, Big boxing events are still bigger than any event that we've got. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, look what just happened. Sports Center stopped, and we and we announced a boxing match. Right now, granted, of course, it, it it involves the UFC fighter as well, but very few things could make that happen, even in the general sports world. Very, you know, a big trade might happen in one of the four major sports, and it might take over the bar on the bottom of your screen. But very, I can't think of too many things that would happen outside of you know, like deaths or something like that, that would interrupt television coverage and that everyone would stop what they're doing to cover that or lead off their shows with it. Boxing still has that ability. Uh, and on a scale of one to 10, uh, the racial element in this fight will be where? <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure for many, Bo, this fight will prove whether Irish slavery happened or not. I, that's all I'll say that. Uh, that. That's where I'll leave it. I mean, but everybody has to admit that we're kind of trafficking in this, right? Like, this is part of the appeal. Like, I don't think John, I mean, John Bones Jones is the wrong size, but you understand what I'm saying. Like, I don't think we can fight John Bones Jones against Floyd Mayweather and get the same interest. 
No, exactly. I, and listen, there there is no way of avoiding uh, the way that race has permeated boxing and, and still continues to. And, and listen, sometimes it materializes in, in very dangerous ways. Sometimes it just does enough to kind of get people through the turnstiles, but it's still very problematic. And, and yeah, we're going to have a whole lot of under and overtones involving this fight when it comes to, to black and white and when it comes to race. It's going to be a lot like the Hatton fight against Mayweather, right? When all of a sudden you're like, damn, I didn't know you was British. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and yeah, and, and, and there, yeah, it'll be a whole lot of people cheering for a guy who really has no hope. That's another thing, by the way. The Vegas odds right now have Conor McGregor set at a plus 700 underdog. That means that Vegas technically thinks that he has a better chance than like Andre Berto or Robert Guerrero or all high level professional boxers who earned their fight against Floyd Mayweather. It, it, barring some kind of farce where Floyd takes a dive, this, this number will actually come down because people will bet on Connor because I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who want him to win. You know, bet your mortgage on Floyd Mayweather. You'll never get Floyd Mayweather <laughs> at a better price than this. If you're a gambling man. All right, that's Corey Erdman. Check him out. He is on Showtime Sports covering boxing. Also, good friend for way back and always will be. Thanks so much for joining us, sir. I appreciate it. Take care, Bo. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. All guests joined us on the Shell Penzo Performance Line. Thanks to Corey Erdman of Showtime Sports for joining us last segment. On the line with us now, the 1981 NBA Finals MVP. You probably saw him in the 30 for 30 last night. His name is Cedric Cornbread Maxwell. Now, Cornbread, we got to ask you, what was more fun for you, winning the Finals MVP over the Rockets in 81 or beating the Lakers in 84? Oh, of course you already know that. Finals MVP. You know, hey, that is unique. That is special, but didn't hold a candle to beating them dreaded Lakers in seven games in Boston. Now, is that one of those, like, I hate the Lakers things you have to pick up once you got to the Celtics, or is that a thing you had already? No, that thing was, I love Kareem. Kareem was one of my favorite players. I, I idolized Kareem up there with the bar. Uh, but once I got to, with the Celtics, it was all of a sudden you had to, you had to hate the Lakers. You you know, that was one of those things, again, I was like being with the uh, Boston Red Sox and, you know, hating the Yankees. I think those things just go hand in hand. All right, we're talking to Cedric Cornbread Maxwell. Now, which of those Lakers did you hate the most? Uh, magic. Magic because he was smiling all the time. Our mission in life at that in that particular series was to wipe the smile off his face, and, and we did. And we did many, many times. I had enough controversy with one of my guys from North Carolina, James Worthy, who, you know, I I really liked. But in that series and during that time in my life, I hated his guts. We're talking to Corbett Maxwell on the right time. Now, when you talk about magic like that, man, you know it just sounded like you was hating, right? So, Well, I'm a congratulator. I think that he (laughs) is absolutely one of the best. But let let me give you a small story how this goes. Uh, I do radio for the Celtics, and uh, last, two years ago, we are playing a game in L.A., and I'm putting my headphones on, and as I put my headphones on just before the game, somebody slaps him in the back of the head. I look to my left, nothing. I look to my right, and Magic Johnson is walking by laughing. So you tell me why I shouldn't hate Magic. <laughs> we are talking to Corbett Maxwell on the right time. Now, how much did Larry Bird want to beat Magic? Well, I think it was, I think that rivalry is because Larry had lost the Magic, uh, you know, in college. And Larry had not won the championship. So for Larry to get over that hump and beat Magic during that particular time, remember, Larry was an MVP during that partic- during those particular years. and But he would wake up and look at the out-of-town paper just to see what Magic did. And Magic would do the same thing to see what Larry did. So these guys were competing in, in a, a huge way about going against each other. All right, we're talking to Corbett Maxwell on the right time. Now, were you one of those guys who didn't quite know what the deal was with Larry Bird until you had to deal with him in practice? Absolutely. I was the first pro actually to guard him. And I remember saying, you know, I was guarding him. I, I was thinking, like, you know, Gavin, you know, great white hope coming in. It ain't going to be that bad. I'm averaging 19 points a game that year before he came in. And I'm guarding him, my hands down from about 10 feet away. Boom, knocks down the jump shot. Second, I move up a little bit, 15, knocks down the jump shot. Now I'm pulling my pants up. I'm sweating. 
And I remember he would knock down jumpers. The closer I got, the further he got. But whether I remember about that more distinctly than anything, and you would appreciate this, I went to another another one of my black colleagues at that time and went to him and said, damn, this white guy can play. So it was one of those things that, you know, you understood that I understood what Larry was as a player. And I always remember different guys in the league before they knew who Larry Bird was. They would come up to me and say, hey, how's this kid of Larry Bird? You know, how's this white boy Larry Bird? I say, you'll find out. Don't worry about it. Now, this is, race is a thing you just can't avoid when talking about this rivalry for a number of reasons. But I always wonder what it's like for the black Celtics players. Like, were all your friends rooting for your team? Absolutely not. If you're a black American, you weren't rooting for the Celtics. Are you crazy? I mean, I don't think I was a rooter for them. Because I think that the impression was that the Celtics were a racist team. Now, let me give somebody a little information on the Celtics. They were the first team to have a black player, Chuck Cooper. First team to have a black uh, head coach, Bill Russell, the first team to start five black players. And on top of that, Red Arback was Jewish. So uh, there was a bunch of diversity, but people tried to go and say, well, you know, it's not a race thing. Yes, it was. Black people did not like the Celtics. That's how it was. And if you found a black person who did, they were a bit unusual. Well, I guess you talk about the history there, but I guess that all changed in the 1970s, right? Like the post-Russell era, that's when the Celtics started looking a lot wider. And I think for a lot of people, they felt like they were getting bonus points they didn't deserve in spite of the fact they were winning championships. Well, you know, you win championships, you can do what you want to do. And it just happened that the Celtics had great white players. And, you know, you look at the the league at that time would have loved to have been and and wanted to be a lot more white during my particular, my first couple of years. So, when you got Larry Bird into this league, it did change the perception of what this what this league was. You got to right. remember that in during the seventies, the that the N word was with the with the Knickerbockers. That's what they you know would start out. So they it, it was an, it was a league that was desperately seeking guys who weren't black, and Larry Bird happened to be a great one. And then after that, I get another great one, Kevin McHale. So. I couldn't win as a black player. All right, sorry to Corbett Maxwell on the right time. You mentioned Kevin McHale. I'm one of those people that I'm like the one-man Kevin McHale Appreciation Society because I feel like people have totally lost sight of how good Kevin McHale was. Can you give us some insight on that? Uh, slippery eel. He would name his moves as he went through his arsenal, his repertoire. Uh, and, again, the guy I had to play against. Uh, he came in. It was like my fourth year in the league. We get Kevin McHale. But the, the weird thing, and I'll let you, this is another good fact. The year that uh, the Celtics got Kevin McHale, uh, that year I was a free agent. And Golden State came to me and said, what we're going to do is offer you a free agent sheet. And we're going to sign you. And we know the Celtics are going to take Joe Barry Carroll. And we're going to take we're gonna take Kevin McHale, this kid named McHale. So we're going to have Parrish, yourself, and McHale. That's going to be our front line. Two days later, they changed and switched the picks with Celtics on top of the on top of that, giving the Celtics the first their the third round pick, and then actually taking Robert Parrish along with it. So it was an amazing turnabout for the Celtics, very much like what happened here right now. The way Brooklyn is the team that keeps giving to the Celtics year after year. All right, last question for Corbett Maxwell: Was it hard for you to forgive the Celtics for trading you to of all places, the Clippers? <laughs> at that particular time in my life, I think I was ready. Uh, you know, we, we had gotten into a lot of uh, who said and who wasn't trying to get back in shape. So I didn't appreciate it. And my one of my best friends, Don Cheney, happened to be the head coach of the Clippers at the time. I got booed in every city that year except when I came back to Boston. So it really was kind of a tough time, but uh, uh, it was necessary. All right, that is Corbett Maxwell, the MVP of the 1981 NBA Finals. My man, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate it. You're welcome, sir. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to the Right Time Podcast. Please come back tomorrow for more. And don't forget to listen to the Right Time with Bomani Jones from 4 p.m. to 7 Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app.